Oh, that's okay. Uh, we have also some emails, which are, we're going to do at the end, um, because they're actually pretty interesting emails this this time, in distinction to some of the other emails we've gotten. <laughs> Let me nice. do a case. Let me do a case. The first case is um, Ty, uh, Ty Smiley, Ty Dash Smiley versus Ohio State University Wexler Medical Center. This is a case of a prisoner who is checked out by the nurse practitioner at the prison, and this prisoner is complaining of uh, back pain, but he has a history of acrylicin spondylitis, and so this seems to be getting worse. And the nurse noticed some unilateral leg pain and possibly some swelling, and so she sent this doctor uh, patient over to the uh, the hospital here, the main hospital, uh, with a, with and she wrote in her chart, "I'm going to send by van intractable pain ruled out DVT." The ruled out DVT message never got conveyed to the hospital, uh, as it were. Somehow, it is not even conveyed in the chart, or or so it, it, it's not clear why it didn't get there. But it didn't didn't get there. So. During this person's stay there, they did look at the leg and found that maybe there was a Baker cyst on uh, an MRI that might have accounted for some uh, swelling of the leg, who knows, kind of thing. But, uh, and as usual, you get seen by about five different hospitalists because there's one different hospital working every day. Some thought the leg was swollen a little bit, some didn't. So, bottom line is they did a, uh, a D dimer and it was um, positive. And uh, that's basically where they stopped. Um, after a little while, they did a uh, CTA pulmonary angiogram, and that was normal. That was good. And uh, two days later, the patient developed tachycardia and chest pain. And um, although the D-dimer was elevated, the doctor wrote in the chart something about uh, it would indicate inflammation. And that I added some question marks after that. Excuse me. Anyway. The patient was discharged ultimately because of the negative uh, CD pulmonary angiogram, and uh, they, couldn't, they really couldn't find uh, much. And as you might have envisioned, two days later, the patient died of his massive pulmonary embolism. <laughs> so the question here is, was this person adequately worked up by the, uh, by the hospital, uh, given the uh, outcome here? And... Uh, up until now, what do you think, uh, uh, Rachel? What do you think? Are these guys behaving okay? They do a good job here. Well, you know, in reading through this, it it seemed pretty thorough, and probably what I would have done um, with my retrospectoscope. I have some points that I can nitpick at, but I think so far I don't have too many major clinical issues. I'll let you keep going. Greg, uh, do you have any uh, thoughts up to up until now? Because we're going to no, get into the uh, now. You know the rest of the story part of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the three things I would say are, whenever you've got somebody from an institution, particularly a prison, we tend to look at them, perhaps a little scant, like their complaints may not be the same. Uh, I was in that position where I had to see people from the uh, uh, federal institution very close to here. And you know what? People didn't believe that some of these people had pain. And I think the first thing you do as a doc is have a talk with yourself and say, you know what? They got to get the same care that everybody else does. And if it looks like a duck and squawks like a duck, they may have they may have a duck disease, and just because they're doing time in prison, uh, doesn't mean that they're putting it on, faking it, want a trip. You know, if I was in prison, the last place I'd want to be taken is to a hospital to have a bunch of people poking me and kicking me and that sort of thing. So, so uh, just a warning to the young docs out there, because they're held a prisoner, this, that, another thing. Just erase that from your mind and and don't use that as a part of your diagnosis. Those of you are suggesting then there's some maybe some bias in terms well, of the I, treatment I think, of, uh, of prisoners. And I think that that's uh, totally true. I and think I think so. if you ask people who work in prison hospitals, 
prisoners often do try to get into the medical system because it's better than what they have kind of thing. Well, it, it gives them something to do. If you're doing nothing, I suppose you can have a trip to the hospital, but I, I just don't think we should cloud our minds uh, with that. That's not a diagnosis. Yeah. Well, I think the question comes down to is, is this was this workup considered adequate for the evaluation of a, a pulmonary embolism? And and like any test, you have to wonder what is the sensitivity and specificity of a CT pulmonary angiogram? Is it 100%? Well, we know it's not. Nothing's 100% kind of thing. So I looked up some uh, prior trials trying, that addressed that. The PIOPED 2 trial, which was came out in 2008, which is in the Mesozoic period for sure, Right. So that the sensitivity of a CT pulmonary angiogram is 83%. It missed 17% of the cases, which was surprising. That, that was among the worst numbers, however, 17%. Specificity, however, 96%. It says that you have, if you have a CT pulmonary angiogram that's positive, you, you, you've got the disorder. Right. Um, I found another paper, the likelihood of a false negative CT pulmonary angiogram in a patient with a low to moderate probability Low to moderate probability is 1%. I don't think our patient here was probably a low to moderate probability case, but 1%, it sounds like. Oh, I'll take those. Um, but I like the last one the best. It's a 22-study meta-analysis involving 12,000 patients with a high prevalence of PE, high prevalence, but over 40%. And uh, VTE was confirmed in 8.1% of those who had a negative CT pulmonary angiogram. So basically, it's a, it, the number's got to be viewed as probably pretty small, but it certainly does happen. And so the issue here is, um, do we feel really good when the CT pulmonary angiogram is negative? But we have this other uh, uh, evidence, which we think is kind of su suggestive. And is there any other diagnostic um, intervention here that we could do to see if our diagnosis is correct. And um, in this study, they said, well, you should have done a, a uh, ultrasound of the legs. And I think they're right. You know, I think they're right. And I, in fact, I, I think they went in the wrong order. I think the order is ultrasound of the legs first and then do CD pulmonary angiogram. If you see a clot with the ultrasound of, of the legs in a patient who's thought to have a, you know, respiratory issues, then Basically, that's the you've made the diagnosis. Now you may want to do the CT angiogram just to show how bad it is or something like that. But uh, and the ultrasounds are really pretty good, although they're again not 100%. So where do you think this case went in terms of who got money? Anybody get money here? <laughs> well, certainly not the uh, patient's family. They didn't, they didn't get anything. The um, this the case was thought to be reasonably handled despite the fact that a, seat, a ultrasound of the legs was not done, which is yeah. kind of like, um, I think that, I think the orders should be ultrasound first, CT second, unless this person is is obviously unstable or something like that, but, but it's going to happen anyway. What do you think, Rachel? So I had a couple thoughts reading this. First, it was a really good reminder that CTA is not 100% sensitive, and especially for patients that are high risk. I think in this case, it's a little bit unclear kind of whether additional, um, it's potentially unclear whether additional testing was needed because we don't have enough information in the case to know, you know, where this patient would score as far as pretest probability. You know, we don't know what their EKG mm -hmm. looked like or their troponin or anything like that. Um, but presuming that they were high risk, like you said, not low or moderate, then the sensitivity for or, you know, the ability to rely on a negative CTA is less. And I think that's just a good reminder because most of us probably get that CTA. If it's negative, we think we're done. Um, so I, I like highlighting that it's probably like we're missing or it's only about 90% sensitive. And that there's another option, which is to do an ultrasound of the legs. And yeah. When you and do that, you don't, you can do both legs. You know, there's probably right. an ex extra charge, but you know, if there's one leg <laughs> kind, of kind of thing or the or try to get, you know, you'll, you miss stuff in the pelvis, but it's still it, it's still better than doing nothing and just solely relying on the CT pulmonary angiogram. When you when you in fact have a reasonable suspicion that this person has a pulmonary embolism, 
Yep. I, um, you know, we get patients in a lot where some other provider sends them in due to concern for DVT. And I might look at that patient, I have absolutely no concern for DVT, but what's the downside of doing an ultrasound? You know, I think the, the threshold for doing a testing there and following the other provider's concern should be super, super low. And obviously that wasn't the case here. You know, it was sent in specifically for that and it didn't happen. I, I don't always follow provider's concerns. Like if they sent them in for a, you know, a rule out PE and they hadn't done a D-dimer yet, you know, I may not, I may not jump right to the CTA, but I'll pretty much always jump right to the ultrasound. And, um, you know, I think I'm always harping about documentation, but if somebody's documented a concern, you, you have to at least address it. It's cheap. It's easy. It's fast. You never hurt anybody by doing that. Um, I, I, I agree with Rachel that you, you might as well, uh, you might as well ha- and go for it. And again, I've never hurt anybody with an ultrasound of their legs. Well, I, I, I'm going to push it a little bit and say, shouldn't the order be ultrasound of the leg, CT pulmonary angiogram? I mean, CT pulmonary angiogram has more risks associated with it. You know, you're giving some contrast medium kind of thing. There is, um, we know it's not 100%. Uh, and I kind of think that looking at a ultrasound of the leg is kind of viewed as old fashioned. Why? We don't do that test. We go right to the CT pulmonary angiogram. Well, I, I don't. I don't think it really is old fashioned. The, if you find a clot on the legs, this person's got a, 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 a PE. Um, can I convince you to change the order of your approach here? Or, or um, Rachel, are you a CT first or um, uh, ultrasound So if they're first? having chest pain, shortness of breath, I tend to jump to CTA first. Okay, all right. And I guess my reason for that, I, I don't know that I can totally defend myself, but I guess my reason is usually we get some sense from the radiologist if they're having any um, right heart strain, which for us changes level of care a bit and I think makes a difference to us for disposition, whether it's subsegmental, segmental, you know, mm-hmm. massive. Yes. So I, if they're having chest symptoms or PE symptoms, not just DVT, I would go for the imaging of the chest first. Okay. But I don't, but if you told me you did the ultrasound first, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. You wouldn't beat me up. No. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, you want to take on the next case, Rachel? Yep. All right. So, uh, the next case that came up was from a medical malpractice insights and talked about two different finger injuries from paint guns. So, uh, basically a patient was sent in from auto repair shop. Um, at that time it, there was no apparent injury. I guess just pain and the the doctor really was unimpressed with the exam and it wasn't until the nurse pointed out that you know this could potentially go wrong that they kind of redirected the patient's care and you know I think the the highlight of these cases is it's <clears throat> one of these sneaky injuries where at time of presentation you can have essentially no symptoms but they can uh, deteriorate pretty rapidly and you know lose their finger and have some catastrophic hand injury very out or very early on in my career using uh, grease guns and that sort of thing, uh, the older guys told me right off the top, never check to see if your grease gun works by putting your finger over the over the nozzle. And they'd all seen it in the past. If you're in one of those uh, shops where you don't see much of this kind of injury, I've seen them go from damn near nothing, to having their hand filleted, uh, the finger filleted, uh, in six hours, eight hours. Uh, when I hear that story, high pressure gun, um, I, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna err on the cautious side here, because um, again, depending on what the material is. Um, you guys all remember Earl Scheib. Rick, you remember Earl Scheib, I'll right? I'll paint any car for thirty nine ninety five. That's exactly That's right. What saying. I'll paint any car for thirty nine ninety five. Now you well, want the windows painted too? Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. We had a we had one down the street. We'd always get some seventeen year old kid who his first day on the job wanted to see if there was paint coming out the nozzle. Well, kid. Just 
hold it against a wall or something and shoot it. Do not put your finger over the end of it. We saw dozens of these injuries. They never ended well. I think one of the things that came up in this, and I think there were some pictures where there is virtually, in fact, they weren't even sure what finger was involved when they first started. You know, they, it was so benign appearing. Yeah. And, and because this nurse was, was on his or her toes and alerted this to the, this doctor to this, this could have been an easy miss. And these misses are all bad all the yeah. time kind of thing. So uh, um, I think the, one of the keys in this case is no matter how benign this thing appears, you know, they, they you, you see this benign finger, and then they show you this x-ray of all this stuff going up the person's forearm for crying, crying out right. loud. Um, now, I, I have to tell you that we got this case from Chuck Pilcher's uh, Medical Malpractice Insights, which brings up to, uh, oh, before we go there, the, not only was it a matter of, um, the nurse's knowledge of this injury, if you're not aware of this injury, because you don't work in uh, some kind of industrial area where they do this kind of stuff, you could just shine this right on saying, I, 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 what's the big deal here kind of thing. You've got to be aware of this so that you don't miss these diagnoses. And the two points were extraordinarily benign presentation and the nurse saved, at least there, there's a couple of cases that they did. The nurse saved one guy's butt because of his or her knowledge of these of this injury and said no 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 you, you got to do some other stuff here um this this um case brings us to a complaint an email in which we have two complaints uh, mm -hmm. now i must tell you it's from a nurse practitioner who really is a fan uh and has been listening uh, for a long time um uh, she got two problems greg now i don't i I don't, I don't really understand this one, but I got to I got to fair, fairly do this one. So she says, "Why did Greg say, quote, are we all interchangeable now when talking about a case where a PA signed out a patient to a physician?" Now you know that's a, a pretty hot potato, Greg, these days. Yeah, it, you know, I I certainly now? have my I certainly have my feelings about it, uh, but. Uh, you have to work with the staff and personnel you've got. You obviously uh, want, you know, certain people involved in various kinds of cases. But, you know, I've, I've raised a question here that, uh, I, I mean, do we need the residencies anymore? I, I mean, have, have I asked a question that shouldn't be asked here? I don't think so. And I think a lot of cases do need to be referred on for other, and sometimes it's just for the experience level of the person is involved as well. So uh, not just their degree or their letters after their name, but the experience they have in the area and the fingertip injury with the high pressure gun is an example of that. You well, know, this, is a, this is more experience about a pass on from a PA to an a physician. And yeah, um, I think this is, this is tangentially hitting at this business about uh, staffing in the emergency department, uh, uh, PAs, NPs, the role thereof kind of thing, supervision or collaboration, all of these kinds of things, which have become particularly hot potatoes now that we know that the uh, ASAP uh, workforce study basically says there's going to be eight or 9,000 too many uh, uh, physician, emergency physicians, boarded, board certified emergency physicians in um, by 2030. Yeah. And I think it's really already starting now. It's not going to pop up, uh, you know, in one year or there, the, there it is. It's going to gradually begin from now and get worse year by year. Yep. So, so Rachel, it's a good thing you have a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this question wasn't directed to me, but I'm kind of confused about the beef. Um, Greg asks, are we all interchangeable now? And it seems like the person who wrote in is having some issue with the suggestion that we are not, but I'm comfortable saying, you know, most definitely we are not interchangeable. We're very different types of providers. Physicians have a lot more training and experience that comes with that um, and additional expertise. And so I, I feel 
fine saying we're not interchangeable. And, you know, if that's really the question that's at debate here, I think, you know, we should, we should talk about it. And it, it's being talked about in a lot of different forums, but just, you know, looking at numbers, no, we're not interchangeable. We've seen, we've had a lot more hours of training, a lot more experience with kind of a wider variety um, of patients. And so I, I think it's, more of a conversation than we have time for right now, but I, I think I'm just yes, confused much, about the beat. Much more. The, uh, so I've been doing a, a rant uh, on MRAP, and I've, over about a four, or five, four month period, I've been we've been talking to people about this topic: PAs, NPs, uh, physicians, uh, people who uh, are involved with residencies uh, uh, that are um, supported by. Uh, Wall Street uh, managed uh, emergency um, medicine groups, those kinds of things. And it is a very hot topic. The PA issue comes in here, the workforce issue comes in here. And um, a there's a lot of different points of view on this. But the second thing this, this uh, person complained about is that she said, stop doing cases from medical malpractice insights. The, the case that we just did was from medical malpractice insights. That's Chuck Pilcher, and Chuck's been on this show uh, with some of his cases. And I take a look at his cases, and I don't do them again unless I think there's something that really needs to be emphasized, or uh, we kind of disagree with uh, one of the uh, recommendations. To, to, so we try to get, you, there's no sense of just duplicating it. We, we want to get some, additional emphasis or change of view of this. But I'll back off a little bit on these 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 cases from Chuck because Chuck has this new service that is called Medical Malpractice Insights. It is free and uh, I encourage you all to get it. Uh, all right, moving, moving on. Rachel, I think you got the next case. This is a failure to diagnose, a follow up, do a check, check on a, X-ray that with a delayed diagnosis. Well, now you kicked me back to medical malpractice insights. Just set me up. Um, <laughs> oh, this is so, another one. Oh, well, well, we probably have a different point of view then. Okay. All right. So in this one, this is back from October uh, 2020. There was about a nearly 400-pound guy who was out working on his deck and developed chest pain, abdominal pain. He went into the ED, had I. I expect a fairly standard chest pain workup with was discharged with a diagnosis of chest wall pain. After he left, the radiologist called the ED um, and the patient's primary care doctor and said he was revising the report or issuing a report that he had cardiomegaly on the x-ray. The emergency physician who got that report didn't feel like that needed to be followed up on. He didn't put anything in his chart. The patient didn't see his primary care provider and died 24 hours later. The, uh, the discharge instructions that the EP had put in the chart said specifically that he would be called about the chest x-ray if there was anything new on the reading, and that didn't happen. And so family sued after his death. In this case, uh, the, the physician actually prevailed, but the judge did say in his ruling that the failure to call him was a breach um, of the discharge instructions, although not a breach of the standard of care. You know, basically saying he was misled on those discharge instructions, but actually the standard of care didn't require that he be called. Rachel, do we actually know what he died of? I don't think so, no. Yeah, no, and, and, and because it happened subsequent to it, uh, we really don't understand the medicine involved here in this case. I mean, there's no, no question that I have had patients seen in the emergency department who some period of time later did die. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I missed something obvious. The other thing is, if you'd seen some cardiomegaly in a 400 pound guy, um, would you have necessarily done anything else about it? Or does it tell us why he was in to see anybody? And I, I don't think it's a clear path to uh, negligence here. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the cause of the death is, but it could have been a lot of things. Well, I think this focuses on the promise or the commitment to call the patient if there was going to be something um, uh, worthy on the chart. Now, maybe the physician thought 
cardiomegaly was not worth talking about. I don't need to call this person. Uh, but you made a commitment. And I think one of the issues here is you making a commitment that somebody else is going to fulfill. It's not going to be you. That right. report comes back a day later. And that, that doctor on that shift, you have given that doctor a responsibility that he was not or she was not aware of that this, this chart says we were going to call. And yeah, the I think the idea is well, is cardiomegaly worth calling about? Um, and did it have anything to do with would it have decreased the likelihood of this person's death? I think the answer is no. But I think that uh, the trap here is making promises that other people are going to keep, not you. Uh, if you were going to do it, that's fine. But it's not on your shift when this happens. And, and and we look bad here, um, but whether there's causality is another another issue. And it's, and as you might have guessed, I don't think any money was exchanged hands here. But um, don't make those promises that that require other people to do them. Yeah, Follow but we them. all do, Rick, because at least in my career, I got a piece of paper the next morning or six hours later this finding or that finding. Now, I was an over-caller, and I know it. I contacted people a lot uh, because I, you know, I was going to not be dishonest about the fact that something came in. Did I always bring them back? Not always. Uh, did I always know exactly what they meant? I mean, you know, I would occasionally see people that had 12 shotgun pellets in them. From, from probably something that happened 20 years before. Do I call on all those? Nah, probably not. So I think in this one, the, the physicians are lucky to have prevailed because, you know, for the reasons Rick is saying it, they just kind of set themselves up to look bad here, saying, yeah, we'll call if anything's different and then not calling. Right. Um, and I think it's actually pretty common, especially, you know, when your ED's busy, you're trying to get people out. I've done this to folks, say, all right, I know you gave us a year and it's not back yet. I'll call you if, if it shows anything. And what I really mean is I'll call you if it shows there's, you know, an infection you need antibiotics for. And I think you get yourself into a weird position if you say, you know, I'll call you with anything different because your threshold for calling is probably higher than your threshold for communicating that kind of vague finding while you're in the ED. And right. that seems like that's what happened here is there was something different, you know, probably if the patient was sitting in the ED when it came back, they would have said, oh, it shows your heart's a little bit enlarged, but, you know, it could be, could have been something that's ongoing for a long time. We don't know, nothing to worry about versus saying, I'm not going to call that patient home and tell them that. I don't think it's relevant. Right. Yeah, I think the idea is not to promise things that, you, that an unknown person is being re expected to uh, follow up on. Because if I were the patient's family in this case, I would say, you know, if the patient knew he had cardiomegaly, he would have come back with his persistent pain 12 hours later. But he was told everything was fine, so he didn't come back, and that's why he died at home. You know, that's an easy yes, easy right. argument to make. In that case, uh, uh, no money changed hands. Here's one where uh, money is likely to change hands. Uh, this is a $50 million lawsuit. This, uh, I, this is from last year. Um, I wanted to make sure we cover this. It's a 20-year-old who was uh, pronounced dead at the scene by paramedics. Uh, from They don't say what the heck happened to her or whatever. She had been placed in a body bag and subsequently found alive and breathing when it opened at, uh, the bag was opened at a Detroit funeral home. Yes. When they unzipped the bag, the woman remained in critical condition and, and ultimately uh, died. Um we do have the ability now for paramedics to uh, pronounce people in the field, and that that saves lights and sirens and all of the dangers associated with rapidly trying to drive around the streets, bring bring a dead person to the hospital. And yeah, and that's and that's really a good thing. The uh, fire chief said that um, when when discussing this matter, he said um, he found it unsettling. <laughs> well, unsettling, yes. Yeah. Um, he said I think that's a that's a fair phrase to use. Yeah, I think that's right. um, this this was a Detroit case. Uh, we had it on the news here for about you, you got to remember this is the kind of case 
that is wonderful for the newspapers and the TV to get a hold of. Patients still alive in dead body bag and all that sort of stuff. It makes wonderful news at five sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what the mental state of that patient was. I, I'll tell you, I'm sure this had to do somewhere along the way with a drug being taken. Uh, I don't know why I would think that. But the other couple of times I've seen this, uh, it was after some drug had been taken, and uh, they they were not in a big hurry to get the patient in there. But, uh, God, if you're going to call them dead in the field, run a strip, uh, do some observation, do something before you send them to the funeral home. Uh, and And I think that that didn't happen in this case. So I was just reading about it. It looks like this was a young woman with a fairly severe cerebral palsy who was called, family called for respiratory distress. And um, when paramedics got there, they said she'd been unresponsive with no signs of life for 30 minutes, but didn't really document what the no signs of life were, at least that we can see. And they called a physician who, you know, agreed to let them pronounce her death um, remotely. So anyway, a little, somebody with some chronic issues. Um, I don't know that it, it makes the case that much different, but I think it's just um, maybe a fairer perspective on it. Yep. And yeah, by the way, the, uh, all in our careers have had somebody who they've come back to you and said, Dr. Henry, <laughs> they've now developed a pulse again, or there's something on the, uh, on the EKG. And the first thing you do is uh, say, uh, Christ, why didn't I tell him to shut the EKG machine off? But this, it's not that this hasn't happened to all of us at some point in time. But I, I think, you know, for physicians who are asked to make these calls, we have to, I think, be sure that there is some protocol for people pronouncing death in the field. Right. Yes. And it's unclear what that was at this, at this right, case. Right, because this is a, a failure of telemedicine as well, because they talked to a doctor. And yeah. And uh, so the doctor didn't follow any kind of a protocol in terms of advising these people. The uh, fire chief said, you know, there's ev evidence out there that this sort of thing has happened before. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody's perfect, you know. Yeah. But in the, any case, this it didn't help this lady one bit. A uh, $50 million lawsuit. Now, I don't know whether, you know, what that outcome was. Did you, are, were you aware of the outcome, Rachel? Um, so... No, it looks like it's still pending. She did die about two months later, and um, there was some uh, punitive actions taken against paramedics, but basically, like, they got their licenses revoked or suspended. They had to write papers and read a book, but the, the main case is still going through the courts. Yeah, I would think that this would be a pretty big case in terms of what it's going to go for. Um, yeah. I don't think you can deny that uh, she was alive, it's like kind of black and white. You know, in my early part of my career, we were required to go up to the floor and pronounce people in the hospital um, when, because the nurses weren't authorized to do that. And so during the busy shift, and that, that's all you wanted to do kind of thing. So it's, and, but yet the nurses really wanted to get this person out of the bed and, and to get the families there and they want to get the thing moving. So they're all kind of waiting for you to go up there. Uh, and so it was always a pain in the butt, but I also remember having this, this fear that what if, what if I screw this up? I, you know, I'm not really taking that, that much time to evaluate carefully, you know, this person, the nurse is probably pretty good at pronouncing people dead. And so um, I often ha had the feeling, geez, I, I better be a little careful about, about this because this is gonna look very bad. But fortunately they, changed it so the nurses had were able to pronounce uh death or or the, or the nursing supervisor or some highly trained person was able to pronounce people dead all right Rachel, do so, you want to do in the news yep in the news so this one is one that's near and dear to my heart <laughs> um i wrote a paper about this not too long ago looking at kind of all 50 states but um this highlights a couple of cases. So first one from Pennsylvania, 
uh, back in 2018, it sounds like you guys talked about this before, the court, basically a patient um, in that case sued to get peer review records from a private emergency medicine group. Um, and the group tried to say these are protected by the state peer review um, you know, confidentiality privilege provisions. And the Supreme Court in that case said, nope, that law doesn't apply to this private group. And, you know, that that seemed like maybe a one off thing. But then there was a another case, uh, this one. I assume it's still in Pennsylvania, but uh, lead bitter versus Keystone Anesthesia 2020 case. Um, same thing. So a uh, patient had a bad outcome. They wanted to get the personnel, the credentialing file, actually, of a, a physician practicing from a private group contracted with the hospital. And that's still going through the courts as to whether or not that's going to be allowed, kind of with the same um, issue at hand, is do the state's peer review protections apply to these private groups that are contracted with hospitals, as opposed to the hospitals or employees of the hospitals themselves? Well, Rachel, I think the, the big question is, can they just leaf their way through a folder? I mean, what if they find other things, other patients, other cases? Uh, I, I, I think we have to be very careful before we let people go back through the, the peer review um, stuff in whatever state it is. The last thing I want is a family being able to look at everything that was put in a doctor's uh, uh, folder. I, I, this is this is dangerous material, I think. Well, there are a couple well, issues here, uh, I think, too, is um, people were asking for, <clears throat> okay, if you're not going to give me the peer review records uh, in, from the hospital committees, okay, that's that, that's protected. Will you give me the, uh, the uh, doctor's um, application to the hospital? And looking, and, and if you start looking now, that's not protected because that's that's not peer review kind of thing. And what might be in that folder might be something that may be, in, in fact, in some way incriminating or uh, reflect on the doctor's uh, past issues at other hospitals, et cetera, uh, as part of his credentialing folder, not his peer review folder. So that was one one element of this. The other element was. ER doctors who are the managers of group, um, you have to be really careful about having, you know, a folder in your desk about the the uh, the, the the problems that, of one of your doctors, because uh, the uh, and if that's if you have a folder in there and you have these doctors' notes in there, they basically are not protected. Uh, because it's not in the in the peer review setting, so they could get that fo folder from your desk, and you you reviewed uh, Dr. So and So's bad behavior and whatever you agreed on some kind of uh, re re program that's going to try to help them out, but that's discoverable, and so you have to be kind of really careful about this. Yep. Great Sorry. Job. Go ahead. I have to go on a little monologue about this. I could do half an hour, but I'll try to <laughs> condense it. But I think in general, physicians, providers are too trusting of peer review protections. And so peer review protections theoretically have existed for a long time. You know, we recognized as a medical community decades ago that there was some inherent value in revisiting cases with an unexpected outcome and kind of rehashing, you know, what happened. And so um, the initial protections that were put forth back in the 80s were that if you were part of one of those groups, you couldn't be sued like for retaliation by the providers you talked about, um, you know, for saying they should have done something different. But obviously that wasn't sufficient. That wasn't really what providers wanted. Um, they really wanted some malpractice protections. And so um, this has been done by both at the federal and state levels. The federal level protections, kind of the most uh, widespread ones, I think, were back in 2005 and basically provided both confidentiality and privilege to information discussed as part of the peer review process. But it was in pretty narrow settings, basically only when um, that peer review is part of or submitted specifically to a patient safety organization, which, it, you know, the vast majority of peer review that happens across country is not. So those federal protections only applied in that context. And so it was a little bit misleading to say that there were federal protections because pretty much every 
you know, departmental level group, you know, private group level was not submitting to a patient safety organization. So kind of recognizing that whole, all 50 states have enacted some version of peer review protection as well. And those are generally a little um, more applicable than the federal ones. But in looking through those, the language is um, construed pretty narrowly. So when um, something happens to a patient, they want to get access to that. The courts review that peer review protection for the state, and they tend to tend to interpret it very narrowly. So like for this Pennsylvania case, basically um, what happened there is the peer review in that state said uh, it's prote- that information is protected if it's conducted by a group, by a professional healthcare provider. And the court went on to say that a private group that contracts with the hospital does not meet their definition of a professional healthcare re- provider. And that's why they gave them access to the peer review. So, you know, knowing kind of your state's specific language and then even beyond that, how courts are interpreting that language is is super important to understanding kind of what, sh- what is and is not protected in your state for peer review. The other kind of main themes we saw um, in language of the states that could you could kind of lose protection um, were peer review that wasn't formally mandated by the institution. Um, if any information from that peer review is voluntarily discussed outside of the peer review context, like you had somebody on that committee that, you know, heard about a case and then told their buddy about it. Now that information is not confidential or privileged anymore. Um, if you didn't have kind of enough, like a, an official quorum as dictated by your hospital policies, you know, to do that peer review, say it, it says you're going to have 10 and you only had eight, then that doesn't count as being official peer review. It's not protected. There's kind of a whole laundry list of exceptions that can really get people in trouble. So the people are still trying to attack um, peer review. And, and, uh, and it's really susceptible to being attacked. Got yeah. you. All right. I'll All right. be done with my tirade. <laughs> get off the box now. Yeah. Uh, I just have a quickie here about California every year uh, basically has the lawyers trying to overturn our $250,000 cap on pain and suffering. And these these endeavors every year, you can count on them. And every year you can count on the nurse practitioners trying to get um, autonomous practice legislation through. And every year everybody goes up against them in the ASEP and Cal ASEP and, and the, the state AMA organizations against that. But this year, the nurses won and got nurse practitioner uh, autonomy uh, bill passed. And uh, here's a so we're going to go back to well, what about overturning the uh, 250,000 ca- pain and uh, suffering cap? This cap has been around since 1975. When I got out of residency in 1975, this cap was placed and it was like, hallelujah, you know, when it happened. Uh, but, 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 but. In California, we have this process whereby you um, gather signatures, and if you get enough signatures, you can put a ballot measure uh, before the people. And so one, one good example of that is the recall of Governor uh, Newsom, uh, Gavin right. Newsom's uh, recall, which is happening in the next, like, 10 days from now, uh, got – you have to get 600,000 signatures of the people, and, and that will get a motion onto the ballot. So we – we govern over here in California by uh, initiatives, uh, and and so this one, which is costing millions, tens of millions of dollars to go before the public, every soul in the state of California has received a mail-in ballot for this Governor Newsom re- recall thing. Uh, this is also something they wanted to put in a ballot. They basically qualified this ba- uh, ballot initiative in November of 2020. But they thought the 2020 election was probably not the place to run this thing when we had a presidential race going too. So they've decided to run this in 2022. Um, they basically have a new bill, which they call the Fairness for Injured Patients Act, which would uh, give people an increase based on cost of living from 1975 forward. So that's that's probably pretty substantial. So it's not going to be 250,000 anymore. It might be six or seven or $800,000. Uh, uh, they also went the, the uh, a cap on catastrophic injuries. They, they wanted, the, the initiative would also eliminate the cap in cases of catastrophic injury. 
such as death, permanent disability, and disfigurement. Well, when, when, when we have reviewed in the past what are the outcomes in cases of uh, malpractice, like 30% of them are death. And, and, and another 20% are gravely disabled permanently kind of thing. So right. what they're describing here are, in fact, almost the majority of suits in the, in the state of California do involve people who have serious outcomes. So that's going to you know, come through the back door of removing this cap. And they want to drop a 1987 limit on contingency fees in catastrophic malpractice cases. Well, of course they do. Um, I think that uh, personally, uh, the cap is too slow, too, too, too low. It's been there since 1975. 1975, you could buy a house in California for $250,000. Right now, you could bar barely get a car uh, for $250,000. Well, this always comes up when they decide to tie a number to a process that's going to go on for years and years and years. Um, state of Michigan, 1965, the, they went along with the rest of the country on raising the minimum wage from a dollar to a dollar and 25 cents an hour. Uh, nothing stays the same at those levels. And the problem is, Rick, what they need is to have decide on some sort of price inflator, uh, which they can uh, charge that against. Because I agree with you, $250,000 today doesn't buy what it, what it bought a certain number of years ago. And I think that that's fair. I mean, what are we, what are we doing with this money? If it's to compensate for some harm, then it ought to have some relationship to what you can purchase with the money. And uh, that's, that's not happening. And and every state has this exact same problem unless they've put a, a, a price inflator uh, into their law, and some states have. Well, this is not just about money, because one of the things that this has done is basically result in substantial number of decrease in the suits that we have, because right. lawyers are not going to take cases where the pain and suffering cap is $250,000. Uh, and so there have been a there has been a market decrease in the number of malpractice cases that have been filed over the last you know at least you know ten years. Right. Uh, uh, now the awards are still you know pretty substantial, but this is the kind of thing that basically prevents lawyers from trying to go and help patients who have been harmed because the return on investment is just not there. Right. Rachel? Well, I think the evidence on how these caps on non-economic damages, how they affect lawyers, is is kind of up for debate. They've tried to do a, you know big studies on these, and it's mixed. Some suggest there's a trend towards decreasing suits, but when you pull them together, it it kind of moves to more, closer towards no effect. So I don't know that if it's safe to say that these caps are really dissuading lawyers from taking on cases. Um, but just in general with this, I was just looking. And so if you adjusted the the cap now, it'd be over a million dollars. And um, that probably is going to have no effect on, you know, lawyers. Of, no lawyer is going to not take a case because the cap is over a million dollars. Um, the only thing that I think the benefit that a cap has at that level is just to um, prevent these cases from the, you know, multi-million dollar punitive, well, not punitive, but non-economic damages like these 20 million dollar suits yep. um so i don't know the, the the verdict is out as far as how well these caps actually work in reducing lawsuits um and with the numbers that california is talking about the cap is going to be so high it's definitely not going to discourage any cases okay uh well we'll see what the ballot uh, measure shows in 2022 uh rachel how about a, something on um uh, what is this? The video oh, visit. This? Yes, 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 yes. It's uh, I guess it's telemedicine and trying to yeah, diagnose so people with the I think, TV. I think we're still trying to kind of get a, a grasp on how this trend towards telemedicine is going to affect liability risks. So we have 
a, a couple different examples here or some kind of early numbers to share. So first, um, you know, obviously when you are examining a patient over video, there are limitations to what you can do. You can't touch the patient. You can't, you know, test their strength, et cetera. Um, so first there was an analysis from Crico, the controlled risk insurance company, big uh, malpractice coverage uh, that, that does all the Harvard affiliated institutions and their clinicians. And they looked at 100 and, 106 claims revolving around telemedicine and found that of those claims, 66% were related to diagnosis issues. And then, so similarly, uh, there was a doctor's company analysis looked at 28 claims and of those 71% were diagnosis related with only 11% being mismanagement. And then there was a, a third Kind of study looking at this by Judy George, published back in August 2020, um, again drafted by the doctor's company, saying uh, telemedicine missed in the cases they looked at telemedicine missed stroke in 20% of those, missed infections in 20%, and orthopedic concerns in 10%. I'll, do you want me to pause there? Yeah, that would be a good uh, place. Um, I, I I never really understood how you could do the classic history and physical with uh, the with a two dimensional screen that you, where you can't touch touch the patient and as you would anticipate the, the uh, misdiagnoses are going to be the number one uh, cause of suit and this is higher than in the emergency department in the emergency department it's around 40 45 50 percent here we have almost 70 percent of the suits for you know failure to diagnose and uh, I could certainly understand that. I mean, maybe we take on too much um, by uh, doing telemedicine and not referring people um, more quickly. Um, uh, any thoughts before we move on? I grew up in an era of medicine, as you did, Rick, when we saw everybody. Uh, it wasn't that we had a screen conversation with anybody. It's what we're used to. Um, but I'm interested to see how the, the post-COVID era, how much medical care is now going to be given without seeing another person. My personal bias is I learn a lot by watching right. you walk I'm in the room. <laughs> I'm sorry, this got interrupted. Somebody, I turned turned the sound off on my phone. It, it's coming through my computer. <laughs> so let me just get, I'm, it's a pain in the butt. Daniel. <laughs> yeah. uh, I also have gotten at least eight pings in the last 10 minutes. What the hell is going on? Mute it. I don't. I'm uh, muting it. No. I, <laughs> I have the button down, but it's going through my computer now. It wasn't. <laughs> right. This is a shame that we have to cut this out. Ricky, would you cut this out and, before it goes to Tom? Yeah. All right. So. Just Hello. jumping back and just jumping back into the telemedicine thing. So one thing that I think why this is still a danger zone is we really don't know how courts are going to address standard of care for telemedicine, whether they'll acknowledge that it should be different. And there have been some cases where they haven't acknowledged that, you know, they're holding um, clinicians responsible for not getting the right diagnosis, even though they had these limitations of telemedicine. Um, I have a case not in front of me, but of a patient who, uh, it was a telestroke. That's probably going to be the first place that we see this because that's been used, you know, even prior to COVID where a patient came in with some stroke-like symptoms. They were evaluated via telemedicine by a neurologist who felt that their deficits were not significant enough to administer TPA. Um, but then, you know, subsequently the patient did develop severe deficits and the family sued for their not giving TPA. TPA. And the, the neurologist tried to argue, you know, based on my limited exam over telemedicine, you know, I made the best decision I could. And the court was not impressed with that argument. And I think, you know, we just don't know if the court's really going to flex and say, yeah, you're right. You know, you're only, you did the best you could over a screen. And the fact right. that these people are getting paid the same amount 
for telemedicine visits, now that they have payment mm -hmm. parity, suggests probably the standard of care is not going to flex all that much. I would, I would think that that would be the obvious argument. You got paid for the service. If you thought they should have been taken in, seen by somebody live, you could have said that at that moment. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you want to move on with uh, Dr. Bill Sullivan's recommendations, who's been on our show in the past? Yes. Sure. So kind of in the on the same vein, uh, one of the things that he advised is to be really careful about not documenting exams that you really can't do. Uh, with one example being looking at, you know, strength or weakness of the extremities, documenting patient's heart rate or rhythm. Obviously, you know, unless you have a machine in that patient's room that's giving you heart rate or rhythm, you can't say that. Um, over telemedicine. And, you know, uh, if you document those things are normal, you can imagine a scenario where a combination of some abnormalities in both of those, like they had AFib and unilateral weakness, you're going to miss a stroke. So um, be really careful about not documenting things that you can't be doing. Okay. And uh, another point on that is to really um, be thoughtful about the informed consent that's getting used before engaging in telemedicine and, and being sure that it acknowledges the limitations because maybe that will save you a little bit of grief down the line. Although I think we're too early in this to know really how that will play out. You know, it's surprising because there's there must be millions of cases of telemedicine being used. And so the incidence of lawsuits with telemedicine is, is, is very small considering the number of cases that uh, that are out there that have been treated by telemedicine, particularly over this COVID uh, period where it really ramped up. Well, Rick, we haven't seen this era yet. It takes five years after the event uh, for us to see the lawsuits that are going to come out of COVID. Uh, there's they're they're cooking out there. I think they're percolating, but I I think we're going to look back in a couple of years. And and there will we'll get a better idea of what's going to get sued for. Well, that there's that delay, and then a lot of states, Arizona included, have changed the medical malpractice standards for COVID. You know, saying that doctors now you know aren't going to be able to be sued for just regular negligence, has to be gross negligence or recklessness to really carry a, a malpractice case for it. And there are a number of states that have done that, kind of acknowledging that we're we're stretched with the pandemic. So right. we, prob we probably won't ever see as many cases as we expect. Yeah. Although I did see a state where they ratcheted back that um, uh, what level of, of misbehavior is required. Right. For, uh, and all the states are ultimately going to wind up having to do that. I mean, that we've yep. gotten a, a free ride here and that free ride is, is still going on. But ultimately, there's going to be a time when the states go back to the, what were their prior criteria for uh, malpractice. Yep. Uh, Rachel, let's see. Oh, let me do this quickie. Uh, this is a quickie. Um, I'm interested in, in rural medicine in particular uh, about, you know, how patients get seen and, and what's the best way to see them and, uh, you know, the staffing issues in, in rural medicine. Uh, and all of these communities that have these uh, uh, hospitals that are called uh, critical access hospitals, they have like 25 beds or less. Uh, the communities really view these as their, their safety net. They like these, they like the fact that they're able to go and get medical care nearby. So, you know, when the hospitals are struggling financially, which they all are, the communities try to support them. Here's the bake sale. We're going to raise money to maintain our community hospital. Well, this is uh, something that's coming out of the uh, Biden stimulus bill, 6,000 pages. I'm sure most of our, our legislators have read this 6,000 page stimulus bill, uh, encourages hospitals to shut down their rural, rural in be inpatient beds and become standalone emergency departments only. Uh, the funding for this is slated to start in 2023 and would apply to hospitals with 50 beds <laughs> or less. So here's a move to say, okay, shut these hospitals down, make them freestanding emergency departments because all of the patients who've got anything worth talking about are going to be transferred someplace anyway. So um, that's kind of what the government is doing in, in this st stimulus bill. Any thoughts? Nah, okay. I hate, I, I hate to say this, but the government's probably right. Most of these places need to close. Uh, and if you 
believe for one second that you're going to get the same kind of care in a 50-bed hospital in northern Michigan that you get at the University of Michigan. It's not. Uh, there are all kinds of things that which we did early on in our careers and we were involved with, which quite frankly require greater technology, greater machinery, people with better training, and and reference. And when things go wrong, i.e. the patient turns in a small hospital, what do they have to do? They have to transfer them out. So maybe what they should have done is transfer them out at the beginning. And I, I, I think we need to kind of be honest about that. I know we all have rural communities uh, around us, and some of those hospitals, quite frankly, would be better if they closed. Um, it seems I think like some of the communities will probably disagree with you, but any, well, in any case, there's going to be money, money to support that uh, coming up for these hospitals. Rachel? I was going to say, it seems like the the thought is these hospitals are going to close if nobody does anything. And so maybe a way to salvage something is to create some point of care for for patients there. And arguably, I think it makes sense. It's more important for a patient to be able to get true emergency services like treatment for their MI or stroke or, you know, whatever traumatic injury locally than it is for them to be able to be hospitalized locally for their pneumonia or, or anything else. And so it's not a matter, you know, it's inconvenient and has lots of economic ramifications if there's no hospital, but it's generally not a matter of life and death. But the same can't be said about the ED. That can definitely be a matter of life and death. So it makes sense to me. I I don't know how it'll play out. but Although there's this group, uh, and we talked about it before, uh, Avera, I think, and out, out of South Dakota, where basically they're monitoring all of these uh, small hospitals and you could speak to an emergency physician at any time to help you with the case. And they make the case that they, by having the ability to talk, talk to an emergency physician, that they decrease the number of transfers to hospitals substantially when they didn't, didn't need it in the first place because a little advice from the uh, board certified ER doc said, yeah, you can, you can sew that up or you don't, you don't need to do this or that which where the doctor on site or whoever it is on site doesn't feel comfortable. Uh, and they make the case that there are big dollars to be saved by not transferring every head bonk and maybe you just watch them for an hour kind of thing. You know, those kinds of things have been suggested by that, by them. We're going to stop here because I wanted to get to uh, some of our emails. Uh, let's do I'm going to do the two that are similar because I, I think we may be running out of time. And, and the two that are similar uh, relate to Umtala. And uh, on one, the person wrote in and said, on multiple occasions when the situation arises and an ICU patient I am admitting will be boarded in the ED for a, for, for a long period of time, I get approached by the charge nurse of the house super suggesting that we transfer these patients to a sister facility in the area where ICU beds are available. He said, uh, if the patient is alert and I, I asked them about whether they're, they're willing to go to another facility and, uh, and if they don't, they can stay where they are. And if the patient is not alert, I make a medical decision based on what I think to be the uh, stability of the patient uh, on their behalf and, and but he said, where does Entala come in here? We're talking about sending a patient from the, the emergency department of one hospital to the uh, hospital to, ho to be hospitalized at another hospital in the same system. Uh, I'm going to hold the answer to that aside because I asked Bob Bitterman, our uh, Entala specialist, to address this. Then there was a similar one that came in uh, uh, almost uh, simultaneously. Our emergency physician was working at a critical access hospital. Uh, when he was contacted by a nurse practitioner working the floor at an even smaller hospital, if there are such things. She had a very sick COVID patient and desperately needed to transfer the patient, but there was no ICU beds anywhere. Well, this is one of these things where they call all over the state, and this, this, there's just nothing. So our emergency physician at the larger small hospital advised the nurse practitioner to intubate the patient and transfer it to his hospital, even though they had no ICU beds. 
upon the completion of the transfer, our emergency physician treated the patient in the ED and ultimately transferred the patient to a facility that had an ICU bed. He said, what's the EMTALA status here where I transferred a patient from uh, one hospital, the floor bed to, to the emergency department? Does EMTALA come in here? And Bob had a nice, clear answer. Sometimes these answers are complicated. These are answers are not complicated. EMTALA went, ends when a patient is admitted, and you can have in your emergency department patients hanging around who are in fact admitted. There is a there very technical yep. technical uh, mm -hmm. differentiation between admitted and non-admitted patients. Admitted patients have different paperwork filled out. The nurses ask a whole bunch of irrelevant questions about you know you when you come into the hospital that they have to uh, answer. And now you are officially an admitted patient who is residing in the emergency department. And basically, if you're an admitted patient, EMTALA has nothing to, to say about you. So in both of these cases, EMTALA does not come into play because in both of these cases, the patients were uh, technically admitted. He says you do need to admit, have these patients in the ER admitted in good faith. You can't just take an ER patient, say, technically, we're going to admit you so we can transfer you without having to uh, en engage in EMTALA uh, um, conversations and paperwork, that kind of thing. So if you do that, there is no federal or state law that prohibits the transfer of an inpatient, even an ICU patient, at, at one hospital to the ED of another hospital. This, this idea about ED transfers and all those kinds of things, transfers to hospitals and transfers to EDs, all focuses around, are these admitted patients? And if they're right. not admitted if, patients, then you are dealing with an EMTALA. If they are admitted patients, then you're not. Rachel? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's clear. The The issue comes up with, are were these admissions done in good faith? And I've seen that litigated several times where, you know, there was a frequent flyer, somebody was uninsured, they were admitted, and then kind of immediately they turned around and said, let's transfer that patient. And, you know, the allegation against the hospital was that motivation for that transfer was because of their insurance status or because they were annoying or something specific to that patient. And then it, you know, it kind of shifts the burden on the hospital to show you know, no, actually, this is what we would have done with any other patient. And that can get dicey. So I think I think um, transferring admitted patients, you're probably fine, as this suggests, but you've really got to like, think twice, would we do this regardless of this patient's insurance status? Are we handling this patient mm -hmm. the same as that? You know, why are we transferring this one and not the two neighbors next to it? And if it has anything to do with payment status, even, you know, subconsciously, or, you know, not from <laughs> you, the physician, but the the hospital kind of suggested, hey, we've got to move one of these three, and they pick the uninsured one. You know, that's a little bit of dangerous, dangerous territory. Yeah, it sounds like it's very dangerous territory. Yeah. Because they're, they're, you're kind of falsifying the pace work of sorts. And the other thing, and I haven't followed it along well enough to know for sure, but my understanding is that if you admit a patient under observation status, that patient EMTALA still applies to. So, you know, we kind of think, I don't really care if you call this inpatient or observation, but if somewhere along the line they've been designated observation status, you probably still have to navigate EMTALA. Mm -hmm. Right. Greg, it's time for wine of the month, oh. buddy. And, and, and we've been kind of sparse in the last few months. What we've do you got have a there? wine of the month. Um, what we're going to talk about is a vintner in California which is never given adequate respect. And that's uh, Fetzer, uh, which is uh, Lake County. It's not one of the fancier counties, but uh, the number one blending grape of California for the last 50 years is Zinfandel. Uh, half of whenever you drink a wine from California, if it's not 51%, you got to have 51% if you're going to call it a Cabernet Sauvignon, that sort of thing. But they're allowed to blend. And the blending wine of California is Zinfandel. It's the basic red. And uh, this Fetzer makes has, has risen to prominence uh, with basic open them up to eat with your uh, pasta uh, Zinfandels. This is one, by the way, which um, I'm very proud uh, came out of my cellar. Um, I, I've had several of the bottles from this case. 
Uh, this is actually in 1984. Um, um, and you think, well, it's gone bad. No, it hasn't. It's the Reds do well. The whites do terribly. But the, the Reds can be good for a long time. Uh, and this is the kind of wine that for uh, 12, 14, 16 bucks a bottle, uh, you can have a great California wine. You're going to tell me that you can get a 1984 bottle of wine for 14 or 16 dollars a bottle? Well, when I bought it, it was <laughs> it was nine bucks a bottle, uh, and you know I've got little notes on the on the bottle. But um, yeah, I'm sure you're going to get some things uh, by this same vintner. Uh, now you won't be able to get you know 1984 wine, but this is a vintner who has been respected for a long time in the state of California for very basic drinkable reds. And by the way, which, which most people don't know, is the stuff they don't put out in under their own name. They sell their grapes to some of the biggest names in the state that will be blended with the with the other wines. Rachel, were you born in 1984? No. Did you exist? <laughs> That's pretty sick. Yeah. So what, you, know, you mentioned that this vintner, you know, got no respect, and I thought it was uh, Rodney, Rodney Dangerfield uh, yeah, wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it wasn't no. Rodney Dangerfield no. wine. No. There you go, Rick. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, uh, Rachel. Uh, we have already our notes for next month, so we're going to try to get an issue out early or, or actually on time. Uh, nice thing to see uh, us trying to do. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Take care of yourself. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. And uh, Rachel, we'll see you uh, hopefully soon. Okay. Bye bye Sounds now. Good.